everyone. Welcome to the Trial Site News podcast interview series. I'm Erin, your host. Thanks for joining in. And today our guest is Dr. Jeffrey Abbott, who did a really interesting study that was recently published on plants, essentially how plants may help relieve pain and help with digestive issues. And it's a lot more complicated than that, but, and I'm going to let him explain it. But first, Dr. Abbott, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. And do you mind first telling our viewers a little bit about yourself and what you do? Absolutely. So um, I'm currently a professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at the University of California, Irvine, where I'm also the Vice Dean for Basic Science Research. Uh, and I've been running a lab for um, 20 years studying a particular type of protein called ion channels. And these are, chan these are proteins that are in the membrane of the cell and they pass water soluble ions across the, the membrane into and out of the cell. And they are involved in all the electrical processes in the body, such as muscular movement, the heartbeat, thought, breathing, and lots of other processes as well. Very interesting, thank you. So uh, I read your study was very interesting. I guess, and it's, it's technical and you know, some people may not have a in-depth scientific background. So I thought I might ask you to try to explain it or simplify it as best you can what you did. Okay, sure. So yes, recently we've, the, the, lab, have, um, the lab has moved to looking at the medicinal properties of plants. And we're guided by uh, historical usage of plants by indigenous populations around the world. But we also do kind of um, a, a screen where we just take plants that we can identify without knowing the history of how they were used and we examine them in the lab. And what we do, we extract the plants. So we have a, we have an, a liquid extract that we can then apply to um, cells uh, we actually use frog eggs as a, as a as a expression system, but to start with because they're very robust. Um, and what we do, we would take a human ion channel. In this case, a channel called a potassium channel that passes potassium ions across the cell membrane, and we we can express those in the cell. What that means is that we can inject RNA into the cell that then makes lots of copies of that potassium channel, and we can record the currents through those potassium channels. So. So every time you have a, a thought or a heartbeat or, a, or you move a muscle, what happens is there's, there's something called an action potential that happens inside the cells in the relevant area of your body. The cells are normally at very negative membrane potentials, so negative millivolts. Then sodium rushes into the cell at the start of the action potential and the cell goes positive. In response to this, potassium goes out of the cell and the cell returns to negative or the resting state. And that happens, that's happening all over your body billions of times every minute, every second. So it's incredibly complex. So we take it down to a single cell and we express one channel type in there so we can just look at that reductionist system. So we are focusing on a type of potassium channel for this, the screen we did, we focused on a type of potassium channel that's expressed in neurons, which are cells in the brain. If you activate this type of potassium channel, you actually make things less excitable or you, or you make things stay in the resting state. The reason that we're interested in this is because there are some uh, childhood epilepsies and other types of epilepsy that involve too much excitability in the brain. So if we can activate the right potassium channels, we can stop that aberrant excitability and stop the person having seizures. That's the idea. So what we did we went to uh, Muirwoods National Monument for this study um, up near up near beyond San Francisco, and we went to the these um, with the incredible um, Muirwoods uh, vegetation team up there. Um, they helped us collect and identify uh, around 200 plants, and for this study, we used 40. So these are all plants that grow in the coastal redwood forests up there in Muirwoods. We took the first 40, and this is just randomly. Um, collected, we took the first 40, and we extracted them and passed them over the cells that were expressed in these potassium channels. Of those 40 plants, we found that nine of them activated this potassium channel in the brain. So we're very, very interested and excited about this. Now, these plants weren't necessarily used as anti-epileptic medications by Native Americans, 
But what we found when we look deeper into historical use of those nine plants, they're all used as pain relief, usually topical pain relief. So for things like insect bites, stings, sores, burns, types of inflammatory pain, uh, rheumatism, that kind of thing, they were all nine were used for that, which was really striking because of the other 31, the use for pain was much less. So there's a correlation between plant extracts that activated this potassium channel and the, used historically by Native Americans. That's for fascinating for pain. Now, could you, so it's almost like they, they knew this, they figured this out by trying it, observing, uh, get maybe, you know, anic getting anecdotal feedback from people that they tried it on. So that's, that's really interesting. It's like basically providing a scientific basis for what they were doing years and years ago. Uh, can you maybe mention some of those plants, common names that people might yes. recognize? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. So, so the plants that we found um, that the, the Native Americans had used for pain and that we found to activate this channel included things like the stinging nettle. So that sounds um, kind of paradoxical, but I think a lot of, a lot of cultures actually use nettles but to treat pain, because if you boil them, um, you get rid of all the, all the things that cause the, cause the pain and you actually get down to the compounds that can actually reverse that. So another one was the Eastwood Manzanita, which is a tree. Another one was Pacific Madrone, which is also a tree as well. Um, and then there was the Dwarf Rose, um, which is, uh, you know, several of the rose species are used um, as for various medicinal um, um, uh, benefits by different indigenous populations. And then another one was a plant called salau. Another one was cow um, parsley, which is um, also used, I think, by hikers as well uh, these days to, to, to rub onto sores or, or stings to stop the irritation. So quite a few of these plants are pretty, pretty well known, actually. And what part of the plant did you use? Did you use the whole plant or did just a certain part of it? Ooh. So we, we want to, part of what we do, we don't want to cause disruption and kill plants when, we, we, when we're sampling them. And we can use quite a small amount of the plant. So we stick to the aerial parts. So, and in terms of trees, we don't take the bark, damage the bark or anything like that. So we take the leaves, the trees. Um, we, there's quite a lot of usage of roots in medicinal um, cultures around the world, uh, but we, we don't tend to use those because we don't want to damage the plants. That'll be another study in the future. And something I read, I think in your study, when you try to figure out what the active component is, it's not that easy to do. Is that correct? It's really, yeah, that's correct. Because these, these, I imagine a plant extract, there's hundreds of compounds in it. Right. Um, so we had to do a little bit of detective work and figure out what exactly is, is, uh, is, is having the effect in these plants. And I will say it's probably not the same molecule in all the plants, but a common thread um, that we found was that many of the plants that activated the, the brain potassium channel in, uh, contain tannic acid. So tannic acid is, is well known. It's the thing, it's, it's used to tan um, hides and things like that. Um, it's also in many of the foods that we, that we eat in small quantities, it's quite kind of uh, bitter, um, but it's also in these plants, the leaves of these plants. It's also in things like bark as well. So tannic acid um, is quite a large molecule um, but we found using our um, computer-based simulation studies and then going and taking the, the channel and making alterations in the channel structure to test out the predictions from the computer studies, we found that tannic acid sits between the pore of the channel that allows potassium through and the voltage sensing part that responds to changes in, in cell voltage. It sits there and it can control the way the channel functions. And that's how it locks the channels, the potassium channels open at, at cell membrane potentials where they would normally be closed. And the reason that works to alleviate pain is because th these specific channels are expressed in what we call nociceptive neurons. Those are the ones that detect pain signals. So if you can force those cells to be more negative in terms of the voltage, then it means that they can't fire in response to pain signals. So you deaden the pain. You, you alleviate the pain, you don't let them fire pain signals. You touched on this a little bit before, but from your studies, can you maybe, I guess, hypothesize what types of pain or the degree of pain that these types of plants would work on, what in humans or animals? Sure, so, so the pain that they work on is uh, probably the most likely inflammatory pain. 
So pain that occurs um, in response to some kind of like an insect bite or a sting. Uh, also the pain associated with, with burns or anything involving uh, bradykinin actually. Um, other studies have shown that tannic acid um, can alleviate those types of pain. And then we've kind of linked those together with the with the, with our results with the plants to show that that was probably the active compound that when Native Americans were using these plants uh, for pain, that's what that's what the molecular basis for the effects was. It's really interesting. Now you also describe how these plants could also be used as a digestive aid, and it is that uh, acting on these same channels, but in maybe but a different way. That's a really great question. So that was the real surprise. So. So we found when we did the analysis of how Native Americans had used these plants historically, and you know, Native Americans have an incredibly rich history of medicinal plant usage. They have, they use over 3000 plants. And we found a couple of interesting things. We found that tribes that were very geographically distinct were using the same plants or the same plants in the same genus, i.e. closely related for very similar uh, medicinal effects. So they use this. And when we looked at the nine plants that activated our brain potassium channel, most often they were used for both analgesia, which is pain relief, and for also gastrointestinal aids, such as preventing diarrhea. So we, we scratched the heads for a bit about this, but then we, we thought about it, and there's a related potassium channel, um, similar to the one in the brain, that's actually expressed in the, in the digestive tract. And previous studies had shown that if you can inhibit that channel, you can, for instance, prevent or treat diarrhea. So we went back to our frog eggs, we expressed the gastrointestinal potassium channel, um, and then we passed the same plant extracts over that channel. And what we found was, and also tannic acid, what we found was that tannic acid, opposite to its effects on the brain channel, it inhibits the one in the gut. So it's almost like someone designed a drug to be perfect at alleviating this mild type of pain, but also inhibiting um, diarrhea because it inhibits the related channel. So it's quite incredible. That was a big surprise for us that, that the same molecule could have these completely opposite effects on two closely related potassium channels. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, and it's just, it's neat how they just had this knowledge so many years ago and we're, it's, science is catching up with what they, they knew. Um, where are you, are you where's, where are you going with your research next? Where are we going? So um, we, we have collected um, around a thousand plants so far um, over the last couple of years. So we just um, completed with the help of a company, a, a larger screen of all thousand plants. So the study I've been describing was just 40 and we did a manual screen by hand of those, which takes, you know, takes a little while. So we've done more of a, of a, a wider scale screen of a thousand plants I will tell you that 20% of those plants have moderate activating properties on that brain potassium channel, but nothing that you would say was, was going to be a big therapeutic effect. However, about three or four out of the thousand have effects that are similar to a high dose of a synthetic drug that's really good and has been used therapeutically to activate those channels. So we have some very exciting experiments to do next. We have repeated some of those um, hits in the actual, on the, on, uh, in the rig using the same process we use for the Muir Woods paper. So we know that they're real. We have some plants that really potently and strongly activate these, these uh, brain potassium channels. The next step is to do a complete chemical analysis of those plants to figure out which compounds are activating. And we hope that moving beyond tannic acid, we hope that we can find some novel compounds that activate those channels in a beneficial way. Um, tannic acid, is very effective in some ways and it's, it's pretty good at topical application. It's not something that you want to ingest um, a lot of. Uh, it, it causes problems in the stomach as well as inhibiting di um, diarrhea and preventing diarrhea. It binds to lots of different proteins uh, in, the, in the gut, which is kind of good in a way because it doesn't tend to get into in large quantities into the bloodstream where it could have harmful effects, but it means that it can cause some issues if you take it long term. And so I wouldn't recommend it being ingested, for instance, um, versus the topical effects, which, are, which seem to be pretty safe. So we want to find other molecules in these plants. We have some very exciting hits. The other thing we're doing is we're branching out to study the effects of these, of these plants in, in our screen on other potassium channels as well. that are involved in things like immune responses. So we're kind of branching out to that as well. But a big focus of the lab now is we have plenty of hits from different plants from all over. We study 
not just the coastal redwood. We study deserts. We study tropical environments as well. I was just going to ask tropical? you that, where the plants came from. So all right. over. So we have, we, we've been studying places. Uh, we've been collecting plants from um, Santa Monica Mountains, Yosemite, uh, um, the Mojave um, National Preserve. We've also gone to the Virgin Islands and collected plants there that we used in, in their um, folk medicine practices, which are very interesting. And they actually have their roots going back to Africa. Um, so, and we're also starting a collaboration with, with a group in Africa as well, actually. So, so the goal now is really, it's, it's you know, twofold. We'd like to find compounds um, that, are, that are safe and effective um, at activating our potassium channels, but also, you know, one shouldn't overlook the benefits of using a whole plant extract sometimes. So for instance, willow bark, um, which has chemicals in it that, you know, eventually were derived and, 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 um, and that's how aspirin um, was, was discovered. Sometimes willow bark can be, can be better than aspirin, but some patients that can't tolerate aspirin because of the stomach bleeds involved, they can take willow bark, no problem. So we mustn't always, we mustn't overlook the fact that sometimes the plant extract can be safer and more effective. Oh, that's interesting. So what would it be that's causing that? Just that there's something in the willow bark that's... Yeah, so willow, willow, bark, willow bark contains salicin, um, which eventually was, was uh, you know, realized was derived by chemists into the salicylic acid and then aspirin. Um, but it also contains other polyphenols uh, that can prevent some of the um, harmful effects also that aspirin might cause. They can also have some beneficial effects. And the, the salicin itself, unlike aspirin, does not cause the stomach bleeding problem. So it's not quite as potent, but if the whole uh, range of different compounds in, in willow bark um, can actually be very effective. Now, willow bark is interesting. I always remember this, um, you know, Neanderthal man probably used willow bark for pain relief. So there was a study that was published in the prominent journal Nature a few years back, which where they looked at, they were able to take um, dental calculus from skulls of Neanderthals and analyze the DNA and see which plants were ingested by Neanderthal um, uh, man back in uh, um, back 50,000 plus years ago. And what they found was the only skull that contained willow bark DNA, the only skull that contained a tooth abscess. So from that, um, they hypothesized, I think it's pretty, pretty good hypothesis, that Neanderthal man was, was actually taking willow bark as an analgesic to prevent toothache. That is neat. Wow. The things that, <laughs> the things that you can learn. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Abba, for coming on. And I hope that when you complete these other studies, please let us know at trial site, because I think it's fascinating. And, you know, these, just, it's just so cool to learn about these alternatives and uh, the medicinal properties of plants that we, we don't often hear that much about. So thank you so much for your time and please do send through all any kind of research results that you have and i hope you do come back on thank you so much erin it's been a real pleasure and absolutely i'd love to come back on in the future definitely and thank you to all our viewers for tuning in i uh, hope you guys tune in again next time